You're cold? Oh, yeah. Where's oh. my What are you looking for? My lamby. Lamby will always help. That's so much better. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Oh, snuggle bunny. Is it snap time or no? Uh, for the other one. That's why there's no supervision. <laughs> Free range kid. I'm cold. I'm so cold. <laughs> You're right. I'm cold. Somebody is this somebody who can help me warm I'm up. I'm an adult with big arms <laughs> and a blanket. Lammy. Where's Lammy? Baby Lamb. Help me, baby Lammy. Oh, buddy. Is that better? <laughs> All right. Welcome to Pushing Past Polite, where we talk about what matters and make the world more just. I'm Laura. And I'm Corey. We're so glad you're here. Well, today we are going to talk about uh, a topic that's near and dear to our heart, both because of our chosen profession and because our role as parents that we're banking on this thing holding. <laughs> we're going to talk about education. Yeah, how it's really struggling right now. Yes. Due to not Very because of any individual person's failing, but because the system is broken and it's chewing people up and spitting them out. And the pandemic laid over the top of that broken system is just um, depleting it of the people that it needs to be able to thrive. Yep. In so many ways, you know, we've heard this this idea of the pandemic being an accelerant. And that's exactly what happened on the education system as well, right? Things were already not in amazing shape, broad strokes. And then you add these pressures of uh, workforce and well-being and uh, all the other jobs that teachers are tasked with, shortage of, of supplies and aging buildings that did not have adequate ventilation. And these things just keep, keep weighing and bogging down the folks that are in it. And let's add pivoting from teaching in person yeah. to teaching online, having to engage toddlers virtually, having to have parents act as some supports and sometimes inhibitors, mm. you know, but still being held accountable by high stakes tests and, you know, other kind of demands around standards and things mm -hmm. and being disrespected in the process. Mm. Yeah, no, I had these high expectations that and for a while, I feel like I heard it on social media that parents were realizing how incredible their teachers were and what they actually do because they got a bird's eye view into classrooms. And similarly, teachers got bird's eye view into homes there for several months to a mm -hmm. year, depending on the the circumstance for the school. And so there was all this talk of like, you have you are worth your weight in gold. I could never do what you do. And then how quickly we forget that. And seemingly teachers are in a worse place than they were even pre-pandemic. They are because there are fewer of yeah. them. So now the teachers that remain in the classroom are over, even more overworked and overwhelmed because there are not enough teachers because people were like, I'm out of yeah. here. I care for your child or for, you know, our children every day for the majority of the time that they're awake. Mm. And I get treated like I'm not smart enough to create my own lesson plans. Mm. Like my degrees and content expertise don't matter in the development or the identification of materials and development of a syllabus. Mm. People are watching over them. It feels like it's just a trap constantly. Mm. In some settings, not in all settings, but in some settings. And why do that when your passion is helping people and you could go help people in some other field that is more highly regarded, has better pay, has better hours? Right. The little money that you're making, you don't have to spend it on work supplies. People treat you with respect. You don't have to get peed on or spit, spat on. You actually or get to pee when you or, need to. You get to go to the bathroom when you need to. You don't have to. I mean, yeah. No, the, the calculus makes total sense. And 
Every time I learn of a really wonderful teacher leaving the classroom, I am simultaneously heartbroken for another person, another one bites the dust kind of a feeling, and yet happy for them. <laughs> you know, it, it's a really hard tension because I care about public education. It's a passion of mine. And because I am relying on it. I am absolutely relying on this system. So I need it to not break further. And yet, when I talk to individuals, I want what's best for them. And oftentimes it's right. not staying a part of the system. Right. Because the system was designed as a place that women go to work and our country does not care about women. Ooh. Well, let's go further back, right? I mean, colonial times, education was not for everyone. And Correct. the educators were male and it was Correct. high status and high regard. And and who was it for? The it elite. was for them by them. Yes. And and for elite Absolutely males. Absolutely right. Yep. Right. And then as the shift, you know, as it became more of a an all have access over time, it's become more and more women's work, quote unquote, relegated to women's work, which is in that caretaking, nurturing realm, which is not perceived as valuable to society. It's very valuable in society, but it's not ve deemed valuable by society. And that hard tension that is because of patriarchy and all of these other pieces shows up in this space too. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for unpacking no, that. No, you're good. Um, you're good. You Thank you yeah, for taking us there. But it, yeah. And so like, I remember when I was a teacher, and I'm sure you ha had similar experiences, people saying things like, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I teach middle school. Oh, that's so noble. Mm -hmm. I could never do that. What a wonderful person. <laughs> yeah. And I think things like um, when I hear somebody who's teaching, who teaches middle school, I say like, oh, you're definitely going to heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like, you're dealing with 30 personalities times four, possibly. Like, who mm -hmm. knows? You're going to heaven. You're putting in your time. It's stamped. Yes. The crown. Yeah, Middle the crown and the jewels the are all there waiting for you. Yes, they're all there waiting for you. Middle school teachers. Mm, special, huh? I have a rising middle I mean, schooler. I can't wait to tell them how much I love them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's like so many things are happening in middle schoolers' bodies that the adults have to deal with. They smell. They're they're growing. So they're like in pain. They're awkward. They're transitioning. It's like big feet, little bodies, big hands. It's the, you know, it's like the Great Dane situation. Yes. yes. Yeah. And then like the hormones and like, the, you know, like the biological changes that they're, that kiddos are going through at that time. Middle school teachers are the Well, truth. and you know what? I, co I come back to you more and more for almost any age range of teacher is that if they're in it now, it's because they love it. And it because uh, totally. not necessarily it, but they love your kids. And I yeah. think that is so important to remember and hold to. You know, I recently, something was organized by our school system, by the way. My kids go to a fantastic school system. I cannot rave about I'm Every chance I get, I brag on it. But there was like a tech issue uh, on connecting for some parent forum of a night that we needed to go to. And I heard chatter from a couple of parents like, this is not a good impression. This is not a good impression. And I thought to myself, I would so much rather tech difficulties and have them love my child well. And teach my child, right. well, we need to hold with a lot of grace <laughs> the educators that are still there because it is very yes. easy to have gotten up and left by now. And they're not, they're, they're still showing up. You know, they have right for our kids every day. They have an impossible task yes. and yet they still show up. And I think that takes mm -hmm. such bravery, such courage, um, such commitment that uh, yeah, I think the status uh, should be completely flipped in the way that we're we're valuing our folks. Yes. Yeah. And we're just living out the fact that what we the way that we do education here is just not the best way. And there are other models for how we could do our education system differently. There's research. There's so much information. But we stick to this structure. Why? And I had so much hope that because of COVID, things would shift. Right. It's this moment to stop. We literally are relearning how to teach in a completely new way. We've got to rethink our pedagogy. We've got to rethink our delivery. We've got to rethink our modalities where they're actually, where are we actually delivering instruction? Do we need a building? And what a great opportunity to rethink. And I feel like it, it's been a lack of, and again, this is not on any individual teacher, any individual principal, superintendent, 
the bigger system uh, lacks cre- political will or lacks creativity uh, on how this could be. It's easier to default to the it status is. quo. It is. It's, you know, so it's like, OK, well, now we're back. So let's just kind of go back to how and things double were. Down, and double down because these kids missed a lot. Write this equity statement. Write an equity statement and then double down yeah. on all that and they we'll missed. And add some air purifiers, and that should probably do it. Right. And that yeah. should do it. And oh, and to the list for the parents, we need 15 bottles of hand sanitizer from each Clorox, parent. Clorox, hand sanitizer, Clorox, tissues. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Hey, I hate to do this. I've mm-hmm. got to walk the dog. She's ringing the bell, like, and it's that time. Okay. Uh, okay. Keep uh-huh. let it run. I'll be as fast as I can. Okay. okay. Sorry. All right. Guess who's back? We back know. again. Laura's back. What's that? Tell a friend. Guess who's back? <laughs> Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, Slim Shady, Eminem is suing one of the housewives. Oh, really? Because, Why? of course, his nickname was Slim Shady. Yeah. And his daughter, apparently, I don't know if it's a podcast or has some kind of a platform called Little Bit Shady. Because she's like mm-hmm. Little Shady. A little version of him. Mm-hmm. And then one of the, um, or two of the housewives have a podcast called Reasonably Shady. And he's saying they can't use the word shady. It's going to hurt his brand. That seems weird and a little mm-hmm. far-fetched to me. Nah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it feels far-fetched. If you're Slim Shady and your daughter has a, is a little shady and they're... Reasonably shady. Reasonably Degrees shady. Of shade. It's like sca- Yeah. It feels like it should be in alignment with your mm. with you, but it's not even related. Hey, okay. well, if he needs a good lawyer, I know where to find you. <laughs> Too bad I don't have any degrees oh, in law. You got degrees enough for me. All right, so I'm sorry Hi. that totally interrupted Flo. No, it's fine. I was really just thinking about like, what are ways that people could actually be supporting educators? Bingo. On my walk, I just had to stop yeah. everybody and walk the dog, and of course, you you know brain gets going. I thought what, you know, not only how can we support educators, but also how can educators show up for themselves? How can we encourage yeah. our educator friends and educator listeners who are still in the trenches, still showing up every day, maybe getting a thank you once a year, well, hopefully more often than that, and a jeans day on Friday. How can we like help you persist despite these really really challenging odds? And um I think the first thing I think of is get to a place where you feel appreciated and supported. Find yourself a principal to work for. Find yourself a school system that gives you the resources you need. A person that understands that you're a human first and you're a teacher second, right? And so if if that's not where you are, there are plenty of openings in places that do value good educators. That would be the first thing I think of. Absolutely. And also, you know, saying out loud what you need Mm. and... People maybe can meet you there, you know. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were sharing about an experience they had had coaching where um, an administrator was feeling really isolated over some incident. And, you know, she was helping the team unpack it. And he was like, you know, I just felt like no one had my back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, well, what does having your back look like? And he he named some things like someone else coming in to help me call families and parents um you know whatever his thing the things were but i'm saying that we need to name mm-hmm. them because oftentimes we find ourselves feeling isolated thinking that people should know mm-hmm. what we need and really if we name them then that helps people to make that leap you know some people are, are so busy being polite mm. And not trying to intrude or assume that they don't act. And you're also being polite and not mm-hmm. asking. But we need you to push past that. But we need to push past that and 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 say name the things because you may think that they're not available to you, but you haven't said it out yeah. loud. No, that's a great point because the other unsung heroes here, I shall not go without naming your administrators, both at the school and the district level. These folks are facing pressures both top down from national and state levels, from bottom up, from student behavior and, you know, sometimes needs from staff, as well as community pressures that are intense. And these folks want to support you and may need 
in the midst of all of their their juggling may need specifics, right? May need you to articulate. Mm -hmm. And I think that could help everybody to be more effective if those things get named. That's a great point. Yeah. And I think we also just have to remember to focus on prioritizing the needs of our most vulnerable populations. Because if we're prioritizing their needs, then we're providing things that everybody can benefit from. That's absolutely from, right. Right. And so I'm talking about our like most marginalized students, our most marginalized teachers. You know, like when we're thinking about teachers, the ones who are newest to the profession, yes. who don't know anything about this. So how are we providing some supports for them to to know that this isn't how it always has mm -hmm. to be? Your um, career switchers, your folks who've had no formal training but yeah. are just starting because they wanted help. Your career switchers. Your substitute mm -hmm. teachers who maybe <laughs> this is all new to them. No, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And by su providing supports mm -hmm. for the ones that are most in need of it, you're going to be supporting your whole school and changing culture. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other th so going to now what we this this ties to that idea of articulating what you need as well as um, how we can support. Something that I've seen done this year with one of my children's teachers that I think is ingenious while well, she's done so much that's absolutely brilliant. But when she has like a really cool event coming up, she's planning this big learning experience. She makes an Amazon wish list and sends it out to parents yeah. a couple weeks ahead of time. And, you know, I can't yeah. necessarily take off work and come volunteer that day, but I could spend 10 bucks and have it sent directly to her door. What mm -hmm. a great idea to think about how we can we can get what we need. If if resources are available to you and if resources are not available at the school, this is a way you can mobilize community to support you, too. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. So I love our teachers. I love our administrators. I am I see the difference they make in my children's lives every single day. And these, to be fair, are not kids that are marginalized, right? My children are white children who, you know, like school. Generally, school comes naturally to them. They have a relatively supportive home environment. I have my moments. But like, and these teachers make my children stay every day. How much more yes. so? for kids that don't have those systems of support. So you deserve right. all your crowns, all your laurels, and yet we want to be here to support you and advocate to make it better. And I want to flip the coin over. Please. Because that same energy that gets spent uplifting children in some contexts is spent murdering the spirit of children in other contexts. Can you unpack that? Because I really, I've learned about this this year and I really want you to share that. Yeah. So the idea around the murdering of spirit is like all of those small and not small ways in which children are told that they're not adequate or they don't have the skills or are held at lower standards or expectations or um, don't have opportunities to explore or the assumptions about their ability or capability or skills or interests or willingness is negative mm. um, or the that it's assumed that because of whatever their background is, they don't have anything of value to add to the classroom. Mm. What that what is what is valuable is the curriculum that's in front of you instead um, of their lived experiences and, and their instead of those li lived experiences that may not align with the curriculum. Mm. Right. And so that those kinds of messages are communicating to children that like their personhood outside of school is not valuable, mm. but that's maybe where their light shines the brightest and that's where they find the things they're most interested in. So over time, that begins to chip away at your light and your spirit. Mm. And so as wonderful as teachers can be and the experiences that you're talking about with your children are what I would want all of our children Absolutely to have, right. that same uh, influence that they have in that positive direction is also sometimes wielded in a negative direction. And I was with some um, youth mentors yesterday and they were talking, someone was sharing a story about sh the school that she's working in. There was a young man in the class who was Spanish speaking, but there's with the teacher shortage, there are no ESOL teachers. Mm. And so the teacher just lets him sit in no. silence in the back of the classroom. No, no. no. And it makes very little effort to support his learning. What is the message that that young man is receiving about who he is, what he can contribute, what he might know, 
how he's valued in the classroom space, how his personhood is integrated Mm -hmm. into the classroom and school space. And that there hasn't been anyone but this mentor who's been able to kind of connect with him, get connect Mm -hmm. with him and and take some time that, you know, so I I just want to give a robust picture that we have administrators and teachers who are working extremely hard in all different contexts and they're exhausted Mm. and strained and stressed and finding trying to find ways to keep themselves whole and also are still have this influence to shape or harm how young people see the trajectory of their Mm. lives Mm -hmm. and so you know i talk all the time about and you you talked you touched on this earlier of if you're not in a place that you love and feel supported, go somewhere else. Mm. Or maybe this isn't the profession for you. Yep. And that's okay. You know, and that's okay. And and that's what a lot of teachers discovered or realized or came to terms with during the pandemic because it was just this microcosm of challenge and uphill and sideways and hurricane battles yes. <laughs> that they were fighting. And it's like, you know what? I don't even like kids that much. <laughs> Like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And we all experience that as new teachers anyway. But then, depending on where you were and what district, the pivoting or the ability to pivot into virtual or in-person and who masking and what that meant and what that didn't mean. And if you had the resources available to actually teach kids in person or, I mean, there were all of these things that had to be figured out in real time on the fly that someone who's been teaching for 30 years may love what they're doing, but they didn't sign up for this. Right, right, right. Yep. Or uh, I will tell you too, I've seen some teachers, I saw some teachers flourish in the virtual format. Teachers that maybe struggled a bit more with um, classroom management in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. A room of 20, 25, 30 kids. Mm -hmm. But suddenly when I Mm -hmm. can hit a mute button, I'm just kidding. But, you know, I can do breakout groups and I with a touch right. of a button and I can yes. give instant feedback because they're submitting assignments to me and I can see it on the screen and send it back with a yes. comment. It was incredible. And I can engage students in a different way. Like we can use the whiteboard on here and people can be writing and it can be interactive in a I don't have to raise my hand sort of way. We can still connect. And yes, I saw that, too. And there are all these different tools that if you know how to integrate them. You can create a very robust and engaging, academically sound lesson. Yes. And thrive. I think Mm -hmm. that, okay, so I'm glad you said the word thrive. That's what we want for everybody. We want that for our kids, for every kid, um, to see themselves as having superpowers, not deficits, right? So the child who can speak two languages, that's a gift. That is incredible. We want him to thrive Mm -hmm. or her to thrive. We want our teachers to thrive and feel good about their work, to feel good about themselves, to not worry about their health because of the stress of their work. We want administrators to feel to thrive and feel like they can lead and be brave and take courageous, make courageous changes to do what's best for their teachers and their students. And I think that takes communities rallying around them and protecting them and Mm -hmm. insulating them from political nonsense, from you know, all the things, you know, when it's time for for budgets to support them and to speak at your local boards to make sure that their budgets are are met and, and funded to the degree they need it and and showing up in ways in big and small ways through Amazon wish lists, through school board meetings, county or district so- supervisor meetings where the purse strings are controlled, all of it. There's a role for all of us to play in making sure that our schools thrive because they are a part of us. They're a part of our communities. And I also want to point out, though, in some communities, what you're talking about is just a supreme luxury Mm. and privilege, what you're describing. You know, being able to go to the board meetings because you have the time to do that. And you don't have other responsibilities that contribute to your livelihood and and making sure that there's food on the table. Like the structure around how education is funded is one of our fundamental problems. Property values, which is 
such property a problem. values and property taxes, right? That like that is one of the fundamental problems because you you realize that in certain communities, because the property values are higher, there are just more resources that can Absolutely be allocated. Right. But I was watching something recently on the TikTok. Oh yes, scholarly and, TikTok. Really. <laughs> and a guy was sharing about. A white guy was sharing about a property he had bought for under market value, right? And it was in a black community. And he then panned and and showed all of these rundown properties in the same neighborhood that were all owned by the same person Mm. who was white. Mm. And he was like, you know, people are always talking about why don't people take care of their stuff you know why do people of color not take care of their stuff blah blah blah. he's like those rundown properties are probably owned by the same white guy who is trying to build his his capital investments and have a have generational wealth for his folks by not caring for it exactly exactly and then and then what can happen is if you acquire enough of that property then the city wants to come take it over for eminent domain then they'll buy that property from you and then they will do something with the property Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's how he's building that generational wealth, like leveraging the system. But the perception is that the people who live there don't care about mm-hmm. their their community. Mm-hmm. And really, it's a way of right. keeping folks from being from having stake. Right. Because it's not it's not theirs or the right. rent gets raised and they're out. Right. 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 So I'm just saying that I agree that there is a role for all of us to play. And we want to just be really yes, mindful about that. That looks fact different. That 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 looks different on different depending on different contexts and that the people who are most harmed by the structures are also the people who have the least amount of latitude in their work environments and feel like they have the least amount of power Mm -hmm. and are intentionally disenfranchised um, around political things. And those are the people who were knocking door to door to come vote and make your voice heard, but they're also the people who they're making it harder to vote. Mm -hmm. You know, those sorts of things. Um, I just wanted to like be really honest about that factor too, that yes, on one hand, we need to be showing up, which we absolutely do. And how can we show up for each other so that the family that is a single parent home and they can't be at you know, or whatever the situation is, I don't even know. How can I step in on their behalf and be a community partner, community member, a community friend with them and understand what their situation Mm -hmm. is and what things make sense for them too? Because they're oftentimes, and I keep saying them, I am them too, right? Like we're oftentimes not in the room or at the table. Mm -hmm. So how can we elevate those voices, echo those voices, be interrupters to things that maybe benefit my kids, but don't benefit all mm-hmm. kids. And, and you know, that's a great point, too, that it's not just about it's not only uh, upon the, the parents who currently have kids in systems. Right. It's everybody. It's people who are retirees and suddenly have time. It's people who are grandparents who are maybe caring for their for their grandchildren, either as primary parent or as, you know, support. You're absolutely mm-hmm. right that it's not just about uh, that we have to see the interconnectedness between us and yes. the fact that if 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 someone is in need and not thriving, then that is all of our responsibility to come together and bring our resources to bear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. That's it. And so I love teachers. I am a teacher. I always think of myself Ye- as a teacher, despite all my mm-hmm. role changes still in education. Educator first and always. Absolutely. A a, a teacher and a learner. And the way in which we don't support our teachers is a very sad reflection of the kind of society we are living Mm -hmm. in. Our teachers should be some of the most highly regarded individuals in our society. Our teachers, they should be getting paid in a way that matches the expertise and effort and know-how and knowledge that they bring into a space, right? They should be treated with the kind of kindness and regard that we, and esteem that we hold 
doctors and lawyers too. Absolutely right. Right. Every every single professional has had to have teachers. It's, right. It's like the profession the, that makes all other professions possible. That makes all other professions possible. And so um I just want us to have that balanced conversation though, right? It's like with great power comes great responsibility. Yes. And we're in it living in a time where that we really need to value that responsibility. Mm-hmm. And take care of ourselves in order to hold ourselves accountable for valuing that responsibility. If we can't take care of us, we cannot take care of others. Oh, that's the case in any any context, right? As mothers, as caregivers, as educators. If if we, Mm -hmm. yeah, if we, if our well-being is suffering, our students' well-being, our children's well-being, our family's well-being, our community's well-being is suffering. And so the adults need to take care of the adults so that the adults can take care of the children. Oh, yes. Yes. And I, in fact, that was one of the things I was thinking about as I was walking today, too, was this idea of what is the most powerful high leverage thing that a teacher and a school leader can do? For a teacher, it's showing up and loving a kid and seeing their full selves and seeing their assets and building from those mm-hmm. assets. And for school leaders, it's supporting the adults who support your kids. If you're it's those same words you said, say more for the adults. Yeah. It's like showing up and caring for the adults and seeing their assets and Mm. building on their assets and helping them identify blind spots, but then building capacity around that to improve where those blind spots are. It's being vulnerable and courageous. It's being willing to not have all of the answers and, and letting people know that. It's being willing to make mistakes, own and acknowledge those mistakes and make adjustments accordingly. And then stay on your face why you're doing this differently. And elevating the voices of the people who are closest to the problems and closest to the challenges. A- right? Absolutely. So, yeah, yep. if hearing from folks what they need, again, that goes to that speaking up and advocating for what you need to. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the closer we get to classrooms, the closer we get to the real, the real problems and solutions as opposed mm-hmm. to the further away. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Oof, this was, was good. It was. We love our schools. We are grateful for what they do, and despite sometimes insurmountable odds, and yet they keep showing up, and so will we. Right. Absolutely. We have to change the system. Yes. We have to change the system. Yes. Love it. Thank you. Well, before we sign off today, we did want to say a huge thank you to the folks who have gone on Apple Podcasts and left a review for us. Um, It's fun to see your names and real people out there that are really listening. Um, Yes, we are appreciative of your time and we recognize that it's one extra step, um, but it does help people find us and help us to do what we do. So thank you. I wanted to read one today from Scotty uh, said, fun, listen, important conversations. I'm so excited to hear the conversations Laura and Corey plan to have. From parenting to racism, there are so many topics that we only dive into with our closest of friends. But getting to be a fly on the wall while others talk about these things can open up a whole new way of thinking and ways of approaching the same conversation with more people in my own life. I just finished listening to the first episode and their chemistry is perfect for this. Their banter is super enjoyable and relatable and it makes you feel like you're sitting around a table with a bunch of friends. I can't think of a higher compliment. Thank you for that. And I wish we could all have a table that we all fit around uh, to have these conversations. Maybe we'll have to try it one day. Okay, live show. We'll set some goals. (laughs) Live show. (laughs) But seriously, thank you so much, Scotty, and to others. We would love to feature your review on an upcoming podcast uh, as a way to thank you for all you're doing. So keep listening. Please share if this was impactful for you, particularly with educators that you care about in your life and parents and community members who may be able to be mobilized into greater support, making sure everybody can thrive. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to Pat. Oh, my God. What is my name? Thanks for tuning in. Push it past the light. Where we are tongue-tied. Tongue-tied yes. and twisted. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate you. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. We encourage you to go deeper in your trusted spaces or cultivate new spaces that foster meaningful connection. Please follow us on social media to keep the conversation going. We are at Pushing Past Polite on Instagram and Facebook and Push Past Polite on Twitter. 
Pushing Past Polite is an independent podcast with Corey and Laura from Just Educators. Our cover art was designed by Rachel Welsh de Iga of De Iga Designs, and our audio is produced by Keith at Headset Media. Until next time, don't get stuck talking about the weather. Have conversations that matter and make your world a bit more just. Okay. Okay, cool. Hey. Sorry, I had to walk dogs in the middle of it. They were freaking out. There was sparking. So much happening. Do not go crazy on the editing. Just let it be real life and relatable. Don't go crazy. <laughs>